Good morning, folks, uh, and welcome to our Sunday morning worship. I hope you're well. I'm the Reverend Johnny, and it's great for you to be joining us. Who would have believed that back in uh, March that we would start this because of COVID restrictions? And then we thought that things would be getting better, and so we're moving into, again, a period of uncertainty. Please be assured of my prayers uh, and the rest of the staff team uh, for you all at this time. And if there's anything that we can do to help uh, you at this time, please, please uh, get in touch. Obviously, with the current restrictions, it does affect how we are able to visit. Um, we still will have the opportunity to visit, but it might mean being out uh, on the front door. It might mean more phone calls into you. Um, uh, but uh, we, we'll work through things as best we can. The good news is, however, that we uh, want to use our buildings, which are safe uh, buildings, uh, as much as possible with all of the regulations that we have put in place for that. Uh, and so I would encourage you to be back worshipping again in our church buildings on Sundays. Our prayer gatherings uh, are gathering each uh, Thursday evening in uh, St. John's at 7.30. And we want to use the buildings uh, as much as we possibly can allow for social distancing. So keep watching out for that as our house groups begin back using the church buildings um, as we have our prayer gatherings uh, and just how we're going to utilise uh, our buildings for youth programmes and children's programmes. Just uh, one or two more announcements just before we begin this morning. First of all, this evening uh, at 6.30 p.m., we have the opportunity to come together as local Church of Ireland parishes in this uh, area, in the Antrim area, um, uh, to celebrate a God who provides and is faithful, especially as we move into this harvest time. And so Bishop George will be preaching uh, at our service, which will take place at Six Mile Leisure Centre Car Park in Ballyclare at 6.30 p.m. Simply come down in your cars uh, from six o'clock onwards. Uh, you'll be put into a little parking space and you'll get a chance to be part of the service and to sing and to uh, enjoy the teaching from the comfort and the warmth of your car. So please consider coming along to that. We've just mentioned about harvest and we are going to have our harvest services, but again, they will be different. Uh, so they will take place on Sunday, the 11th of October uh, for our two morning services. And at those services, what we're going to ask you to do, instead of the churches having decorations uh, that we normally would have, we would ask you to consider bringing along um, a non-perishable item that would be uh, used as a donation for the Newton Abbey Food Bank Ministry. Uh, and at the back of each of the churches, we'll have a, a tub where you can deposit those things uh, into. So please consider uh, coming along and being part of that. Remember, to come along to the services, you need to book online or simply phone through uh, to myself. Also in our announcements is the news that uh, Reverend uh, Alan uh, McCracken and his wife Karen have now, uh, I suppose, officially joined us after Alan was ordained uh, two Sundays ago. Uh, and it's great to have him around. He'll be around just on a part-time basis for this year as he finishes his studies. And we're delighted that Alan uh, will be uh, preaching this morning at our service. Please make yourself known to him if you see him around or if he comes to, to uh, pay you a visit, uh, please welcome him uh, into our parish. It is great uh, to have them with us. All the other announcements uh, are available via our website or uh, you should receive uh, an email or have received an email with the announcements for this week. Uh, David, uh, our administrator, is starting to come back uh, into things uh, with limited hours at the minute. So again, uh, uh, be uh, gracious to, to David as he gently uh, comes back into, into parish life again uh, after his illness. As we begin our service now, let me uh, open in a word of prayer. 
Father God, give us a real sense of your presence today as we worship you. Grant us the attitude and gratitude as we remember your goodness towards us. Grant us the desire to remember the sins in our lives this week and to come in penitence to, before you. And Lord, grant us the joy as we remember your grace and your love towards us, enabling us to lift up our hearts in humble prayer and fervent praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our worship time together. Um, I'm coming to you from Valencia, Spain, so we're going to do a little bit of a, a multicultural worship service this morning. Um, we're going to start with uh, Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing, and uh, then we're going to move on to um, a beautiful song, um, I Exalt Thee. Um, that we are also going to try a little verse in Spanish. It's very, very easy, so don't worry too much. Um, and we'll have the words up for you as well. So um, join with us this morning as we sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Thank you. 
But certainly for me, I reflect regularly and I'm reminded in my parish visits uh, from people about the grace and mercy that God shows us. It's very easy, I think, in daily life um, to take for granted uh, the mercy and the grace which God does show to us. We are certainly not worthy um, to receive that forgiveness and yet time and time again as we come to God and um, he does forgive us there is a danger however as we come to him with our wrongdoings and um, that we think uh, that uh, it's just simple simply a case of saying sorry and moving on but that's not what repentance is repentance is about recognizing our sin before a holy God and in doing so, recognizing that we must turn completely away from that. And we need God's strength to do that. But if we come time and time and time again, just simply asking for forgiveness, but don't do anything actively to change that attitude, to change that behavior, to change those actions, then that's not repentance. That, that, that is simply coming along to God as some kind of machine and saying, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. So today as we come in an act of repentance before God, let's take a moment of silence to reflect on maybe one or two things in our lives where we desperately need God's help to change, to turn around our lives from that attitude, from that behavior, from that action. And as we say these words, which will come on the screen, um, we do so with the, uh, the intention in this next week and in the weeks ahead to do something actively about that, to not simply go back to those old ways. And so we pray together. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins, that we may behold the glory 
of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sharon is going to now give us our reading as we follow the book of Acts. And then I'm delighted that uh, Alan, Reverend Alan now, as I should say, will come and uh, speak to us. The reading is taken from Acts chapter 14, beginning to read at verse 1. The same thing happened in Inconium. Paul and Barnabas went to the synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of Jews and Gentiles became believers. But the Jews who would not believe stirred up the Gentiles and turned them against the believers. The apostles stayed there for a long time, speaking boldly about the Lord, who proved that their message about his grace was true by giving them the power to perform miracle, miracles and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some were for the Jews, others for the apostles. Then some Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, decided to ill-treat the apostles and stone them. When the apostles learned about it, they fled to the cities of Lystera and Derbe in Laconia and to the surrounding territory. There they preached the good news. In Lystera there was a man who had been lame from birth and had never been able to walk. He sat there and listened to Paul's words. Paul saw that he believed and could be healed. So he looked straight at him and said in a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. The man jumped up and started walking around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they started shouting in their own Laconian language. The gods have become like men and have come down to us. They gave Barnabas the name Zeus and Paul the name Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of the god Zeus, whose temple stood just outside the town, brought bulls and flowers to the gate. For he and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifice to the apostles. When Barnabas and Paul heard what they were about to do, they tore their clothes and ran into the middle of the crowd shouting, Why are you doing this? We ourselves are only human beings like you. We are here to announce the good news. To turn you away from these worst of things to the living God, who made heaven, earth, sea and all that is in them. In the past he allowed all people to go their own way, but he has always given evidence of his existence by the good things he does. He gives you rain from heaven and crops at the right times. He gives you food and fills your hearts with happiness. Even with these words, the apostles could hardly keep the crowd from offering a sacrifice to them. Some Jews came from Antioch and Pisidia and from Iconium. They won the crowd over to their side, stoned Paul and dragged him out of the town, thinking that he was dead. But when the believers gathered round him, he got up and went back to the town. The next day, he and Barnabas went to Derby. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I would like to begin by sharing with you all a film that I seen many years ago. And while preparing for my talk this morning, I watched it again. The film is entitled Dr. David Livingstone. And the film is about the inspirational story of Dr. Livingstone's expedition to Africa in the 19th century. He was a Christian ministry with a vision to serve God and share the love of Christ to the African people and also free them from slavery. In his journal, he records his narrow escape from Milan, his negotiations with an African chief who Livingstone converted to Christianity. In turn, the African chief converted his own tribe to Christianity. And when British missionaries returned to South Africa in 1859, they found the inhabitants holding Christian services and confessing their belief in Jesus Christ. Livingstone continued his missionary work going deeper into Central Africa, which led him to lose contact with the world for six years, until he was discovered by Stanley, who greeted him with the legendary words, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. Stanley stayed 
with Livingstone for six months in Africa before returning to England to write his famous novel How I Find Livingstone. On the 1st of May 1873, Dr Livingstone died. He was discovered by his followers, not in his bed, but beside it as if he was in prayer to God. Before his death, he recorded in his journal, All that I am, I owe to Jesus Christ, revealed to me in his divine book. Dr Livingstone evangelised the African nation, just like the Apostle Paul 2,000 years before on his missionary journey by taking the gospel of our Saviour Christ into unknown territory. As we continue with the Apostle Paul on his first missionary journey in Acts 14, 1-20, we read of Paul and Barnabas exploring the unknown territory in Iconium, Lystra and Derbe. In these texts we read of persecution, paganism and perseverance and we will see how Paul and Barnabas persevered through fierce opposition to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, the word of God, the message of salvation and the message of Christ's grace. Grace was the subject of Paul's preaching. God showed his grace by enabling Paul to heal the sick so that Paul could successfully carry out his mission to spread the gospel. In chapter 14, verse 3, the text reads, So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. This is the message that the Apostle Paul took to many towns and cities that he could on his missionary journeys. Paul today gives us all the encouragement when we read about Paul's account in Acts. If we are truly followers of Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit, we too can endure opposition or whatever life throws at us with courage and confidence. It will not be easy, but all of us can do it through the resurrection power of Christ. For example, the Apostle Paul teaches in Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. We pick up the narrative in Acts 14, 1-7, where Paul and Barnabas arrive in the city of Iconium which is now called Konya, part of present-day Turkey. As we have read previously in Acts 13, Paul's mission strategy was first to go to the Jewish synagogue, which was central to Paul's mission to preach the gospel there. And we can see from the very beginning in Acts 14, preaching the word of God is central to the church mission to bring people to Christ. The text tells us that Paul and Barnabas' preaching was so effective that large numbers of both Jews and Gentiles believed in the gospel. The preaching of Paul was the catalyst that sparked the early church movement and church plants in which Christianity first took root. As we continue with the text, we see the same pattern appearing that unbelieving Jews start to cause trouble for the missionaries. They began a smear campaign to poison the minds of the Gentiles against their brothers. In spite of this persecution, Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time in Iconium and performed miraculous wonders through them. However, the city remained divided about them. Some said it with the Jews, and others with the apostles. Eventually, the Jews had persecuted some of the Gentiles not to listen to Paul and Barnabas' teaching, and now they plotted to gather a mob to violently assault Paul and Barnabas, to stone them to death. But Paul and Barnabas found out and left the city before they could be captured, but they would not be silenced in the face of persecution. Jesus had taught 
in Matthew 10, 23. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Both missionaries went to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derby, where they continued to preach the good news of Christ in the surrounding cities. The writer of Acts, Luke, tells us of a miracle that occurred in Lystra, which is the healing of a crippled man from birth. Paul had been speaking to the crowds and was somehow drawn to the faith of this crippled man. Paul looked directly at the man and called out, Stand up on your feet. At once the man jumped up and began to walk. In this miracle, and the language describing it, we find several parallels to the story of Peter in Acts 3, healing the crippled beggar at the beautiful gate. Lame from birth, looked directly at him, jumped up and began to walk. I believe there are several reasons why these accounts of miracles are included in this narrative. Firstly, throughout the narrative of Acts, the early church is defining its identity, bringing people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And secondly, it shows that God through the Holy Spirit and the healing power of Christ is with Paul and Barnabas each step of the way on their journey. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they thought they were experiencing a divine visitation from the gods of Zeus and Hermes. They called Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The crowd's superstitious and fanatical behaviour comes down to a local legend that told of supposed visit by the same area by Zeus and Hermes. They were, however, not recognised by some people except an old couple. So the crowds gathering in Lystra were determined not to allow such an oversight to happen again. This is why they attempted to worship Paul and Barnabas and they cried out in their native Lyconican language the gods have come down to us in human form. It is understandable that Paul did not understand what they were saying, as he himself probably spoke the Greek language. It only dawned on them what was happening when the priest of Zeus brought bulls and wreaths intending to offer sacrifices to them. As a response to this, both Paul and Barnabas tore off their clothes to express their horror at the people's blasphemy and they rushed out to the crowd protesting against their intention, shouting and insisting that they were human, just like them. The text tells us in verse 15 of the sermon Paul preached to the Listerians in hope of stopping the Listerians attempting to worship them. It is an example of how the gospel was first introduced to a pagan audience. The sermon differs in content from those delivered by Paul to the Jews and Gentile followers of Judaism. Paul preached to the Jews when they had the luxury of drawing on the Old Testament scriptures, its history, prophecies and law. But with the pagans in Lystra, Paul focused not on scripture they did not know, but on the natural world around them, which they could see and which they knew. Paul was bringing the good news. He begged them to turn away from these worthless things of idolatrous worship to the living and true God. Paul spoke of the living God as the creator of heaven, earth and sea and everything in them. This was a very simple form of natural theology. It means that nature itself bears witness to the existence of a creator God. In verse 17, Paul went on to insist that the works of creation should lead us to understand that God is kind and merciful. The proof of God's kindness can be seen in him providing rain for the crops. God showed us present through Christ and the good things that we all enjoy. 
Paul in these verses is reminding all of us today the importance to give thanks for God's creation. The beautiful sunrises and sunsets, the life-giving nature of water, the beauty of the sky and the mountains. And it's a message to each one of us to understand the importance of creation value, to appreciate the natural environment and to take action to prevent further environmental damage happening to God's creation, the earth. Now, when you get to know me over the coming weeks and months, you'll find that creation care is one of my passions. And I believe when you love and care for God's creation, your understanding of God and his purpose and his plans for all our lives is that he calls us to enter into a closer relationship with him through belief and faith in Jesus Christ. All of us will shortly stand up this morning and affirm our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. I believe each week when we recite the Creed, we are reminded of God's awesome power as creator. And that will help us better to understand the natural world around us. And it definitely reminds me of God's power and creativity. One of my favourite Psalms is Psalm 8. And it gives us a beautiful description. And it's a poem written from the heart that reflects God's majesty that is displayed in creation. The heavens declare God's glory and the special place humanity has been given to be caretakers of looking after this beautiful blue planet Earth. And as Christians, it's important to make this connection between nature and God revealed to us in Jesus Christ, the Word who became flesh and lived amongst us, who died on the cross to provide the way for all of us to receive forgiveness. The final verses of Acts 14 tells us that the Laconians did not believe Paul. They stoned him and they dragged him out of the city and left him for dead. But Paul was okay. He got up, he shook the dust off his clothes and Paul went back into the city. And the same is true today. Some people do not believe the gospel. But we have to give thanks to missionaries like the Apostle Paul and Dr. David Livingstone, who gives us the example to preach the good news. And if it's not accepted, we follow our Saviour's words in Matthew 10, verse 23. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. With this in mind, it is the church's mission and our mission to keep striving to share the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. The Collect for the 16th Sunday after Trinity. O Lord, hear the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfil them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Psalm 145 verses 13 to 16. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the love and the grace you lavish upon us. Thank you that through Jesus we can approach your throne of confidence. No matter how often we fail you, you are there for us. Your right hand holds us fast. When we call out to you, you hear us. You are an ever-present help in trouble. Lord, thank you for giving us a place to turn, to rest and to find shelter no matter where we are or what we face. Thank you that you strengthen us and embolden us, especially through times like these. Thank you that we know we can always trust you no matter what. 
Lord, I want to pray especially for the students going back this year, especially final year students in my degree course and many others like them. Um, Lord, you know getting a placement this year was and is incredibly hard. And even going back to uni this semester will be hard and those choosing to do so as many classes are online without face-to-face -face interactions with lecturers and our friends. Um, so Lord, I pray protection over those returning to campus and classes online. I pray they have a bright future and everything in their lives goes according to your great plan. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, to us, your plan may seem like one very large, very difficult jigsaw that we have no hope of ever comprehending. So we tend to take control, trying to fit pieces together that don't fit, or complaining about the rough edges or difficult parts we just don't get, like this pandemic and where our futures are going and what they hold. But Lord, you have the full picture, the lid of the jigsaw. You know where all the small, hard and even trying pieces fit together, because you always have perfect timing. Knitting together your perfect plan and everyone knows you can't complete a puzzle without the edges. So Lord, I pray people everywhere will learn, that, learn to trust you and know that they need not worry because with you in control, their futures are secure. Thank you that you're always near. Thank you for preventing constant attack that we know nothing about. Let us run this race of life and know you, we have you cheering at the finish line for us, Lord. May you always be in our corner. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father God, we bring before you today those who need to reach out for your right hand and for those who need to seek protection under your wings. We think of those who are ill, either in hospital or at home, those awaiting test results, the bereaved, the lonely, those who are anxious, those in financial difficulty, those facing an uncertain future due to lack of job security and wondering what tomorrow will bring. Lord, you tell us to cast our anxieties on you because you care for us. How wonderful it is that the creator of the universe, the one who calls every star by name, knows us all individually and cares for us all so deeply. As we read in Isaiah 40, you tend your flock like a shepherd, you gather the lambs in your arms and carry them close to your heart. Bring comfort to those who need you. Meet them, Father, at their point of need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Over the last months, Lord, you have blessed us and given us the privilege of reaching out to our community. We lift up to you those who received school uniforms and picnics, those who need the help of the food bank, baby basics and Christians against poverty. Thank you that we were able to bring hope to people, especially to those who felt they were in a hopeless situation, and that we had the opportunity to show your love. We pray that through these initiatives, people will see you and that they will seek to find Jesus. Guide us, Lord, as church and as individuals as to how we can continue to bless our community and to glorify your name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, Thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Show us, Lord, where you want us to spread that fragrance. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In these difficult times of COVID-19, Father, we ask for your wisdom for those who have to make decisions. For our politicians, we pray that they will be united in their approach and that they will work in the best interests of the people and put party politics aside. We pray for those working in vaccines and treatments. And we pray for our teachers as they work through this new normal. We pray for our church leaders as they work to make our churches safe, that we may come and worship you. We lift up especially to you, Johnny, and our select vestry. We pray too for common sense to prevail as people go about their day-to-day -day business. As we are now under tighter restrictions, help us all to remember that we have a responsibility to each other, that we have to love our neighbours as ourselves. We pray especially for those who will feel increasingly isolated as families can no longer meet together in private dwellings. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Finally, Father, you have promised that you hear the prayers of those who ask in faith in your son's name. We thank you that you are able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. We pray that in the week ahead, you will help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and that we will glorify you in all that we say and do. Amen. Well, folks, that's the uh, end of our time together, almost. And just before I hand over uh, to Will, uh, as he leads us in our final song, May I remind you of our uh, act of worship tonight as we gather in uh, the car park at Ballyclare. Please uh, come along to that. Let me pray God's blessing as we finish. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Father who will do anything for you, who loves you so much, Jesus, his Son, who was willing to go so far as to go to the cross to die for you and for me. And for God the Holy Spirit, who wants to walk with you, to journey with you, to instruct you each and every day. May you know him this day and in the days ahead. Amen. Well, this last song is definitely from a not so sunny Valley Fair. It's one Emma and I did a few months ago, and it's from those lovely words in Lamentations 3, just reminding us how the steadfast love of the Lord never stops, it never ceases. Hey.